Hello. I'd like to tell you about two objects here at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford that grabbed my attention as a mathematician. The first is this rather splendid map of Oxfordshire. It's huge, it's hard to miss, but that's not the only reason I noticed it. I really love maps, not just because they're incredibly useful, but also because they're very mathematical objects. Of course, the first thing you do when you find a map of your local area is to try to find your home. Even though this map was made in the 17th century, based on 16th century data, I can still recognise the places on it. The map helps me to know my place in the world. I can see the village where I live and how it's related to Oxford, where I work, and to other nearby towns and villages. This is part of what I love about maps. The process of making a map is inherently mathematical. Mathematicians are good at abstraction, at identifying the important features of a situation and finding a way to make sense of them. Oxfordshire is a pretty big place, and so the person making this map had to make decisions. Which places to include, which to miss out? Is it important to show the roads, or the rivers, or the areas with lots of trees, or the places with most people, or the hills? In this case, the map focuses on Oxfordshire, and is one of a series of four, the counties of Gloucester, Warwick, Worcester, and Oxford. This map was woven in the 1660s, and is a version of an Elizabethan tapestry commissioned by the wealthy landowner Ralph Sheldon in 1590. The maps were based on surveys made by Christopher Saxton in the 1570s, and in this case, the mapmaker has chosen to highlight the lands and houses of Sheldon and his friends. Making these decisions is crucial. It's not just about deciding what will look pretty, it's much more important than that. A map is an abstract version of the world around us. We take the complexity of reality and try to capture the important features in a diagrammatic representation. And that process is used by mathematicians all the time, whether modelling the real world or studying pure mathematics. I guess that one of the exciting moments for map makers was when we learned that the world isn't flat. Making a flat map of a flat world isn't easy, but how do we even go about making a map of a round world? Of course, one answer is to make a globe, like this rather beautiful pocket globe, on loan to the Ashmolean from the Museum of the History of Science in Oxford. This was made between 1760 and 1800. The globe shows the Earth, and the inside of this fish skin case, possibly shark skin, shows the constellations. We can put the whole world on here. Well, an abstract, simplified version showing its key features. But a globe is not always practical or convenient. What if we really, really want a flat map of a round world? The tapestry manages to do this rather nicely by showing just a small patch of the Earth. If we take only a small region of the Earth's surface, it looks fairly flat. After all, that's why we thought for such a long time that the Earth was flat. A mathematician would say that the Earth is locally Euclidean, which means that any small patch of it looks like a flat surface, the usual Euclidean plane. Unfortunately, flat maps start to be more problematic when we're trying to represent larger regions of the Earth, because it, actually the surface of the Earth isn't flat, it isn't Euclidean. It's one of the most natural examples of spherical geometry. Here's one way in which spherical geometry is fundamentally different from normal Euclidean geometry. If I draw any triangle on this board, its angles add up to 180 degrees. But that simply isn't true on a sphere. We can see this on the globe. If I take a triangle with one corner at the North Pole, one on the equator, and a third also on the equator but a quarter of a turn round, then we have a triangle with three 90 degree angles and an angle sum of 270 degrees. Non-Euclidean geometry is a fascinating subject and we're walking across it all the time. So if these two shapes have fundamentally different properties, how do you make a flat map of a round world? Again, it's all about being clear what the purpose of your map is. A sailor planning a trip from Southampton to Cherbourg has no problem. The English Channel is a small enough patch of the Earth that a flat map is a good enough approximation. But if she's going to sail from Southampton to New York, then it really matters that the Earth is approximately spherical. The shortest distance is along an arc of a great circle, and we need a special kind of map to show this. So here's Southampton, here's New York. To find the shortest route between them, we slice the globe into two hemispheres, with the dividing line including both cities. This dividing line is a circle the same size as the equator, which is here, but shifted round a bit. It's called a great circle. The shortest route between Southampton and New York follows that circle. 
You might have seen maps like this on long flights. On a transatlantic flight, it looks as though the plane's route is curving up towards the Arctic, but in fact it's the shortest route between start and finish, along a great circle. It's very hard to illustrate that on a flat map. In order to represent the curved surface of the Earth on a flat piece of paper, map makers use a technique called projection. In fact, it's a bit more complicated than that, as there are many different projections leading to different maps. You might have heard of the Mercator projection, or the Peters map. Unfortunately, the fundamental difference in geometry between the flat plane and the spherical Earth means that it is impossible to preserve both areas and angles, so we have to compromise somewhere, we have to distort something. This can have profound effects. For example, if we distort the areas, then some countries incorrectly seem much larger than others. One of my favourite projections that's very helpful in mathematics as well as in cartography is the stereographic projection, which distorts distances and areas, but preserves angles between lines. Imagine placing the Earth on a very large piece of paper, with the South Pole at the bottom resting on the paper. We stand at the North Pole with a torch that can see through the Earth. And we shine the torch at each point on the surface of the Earth, and we see where the torch beam continues on to touch the piece of paper. So this point here, for example, gets mapped to here. And we do this for all possible points on the Earth's surface. So the South Pole gets mapped to itself, and the equator gets mapped to a large circle in the paper. The North Pole doesn't get mapped anywhere at all, but that's the only point on the sphere that gets missed out. This is great, because although it distorts the areas of countries, the lines of latitude and longitude are preserved, along with the angles between them, so the resulting map is genuinely useful for navigation. Historically, some map makers chose to use stereographic projection, whether for mapping the Earth or the heavens, although it does have the disadvantage that the resulting map is infinitely large. Usually, people map two hemispheres separately to deal with this. Stereographic projection also has all sorts of interesting connections with geometry and complex numbers, but I think maybe that's a story for another time. Now, how do I get out of here? Does, does anyone have a map? <laughs>